and start recording. Brilliant. Welcome to Hashtag Wednesdays Weekly, a weekly seminar slash information session in collaboration with the voluntary sector and public sector partners. This week, the host is Phil Worthington, Community Partnership Manager from Rochdale Borough Housing. He'll be delivering a training on Rochdale Borough Housing, the UK's first employee and tenant owned social landlord. Over to Phil. Thanks very much, Tara, and hi everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. So, for those of you that uh, haven't got the ability to see these slides, apologies, some of it may go over your head, but for everyone else, fingers crossed, when I click this button, you should be able to see uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm the Community Partnership Manager from Rochdale Borough Wide Housing, um, with the largest landlord in Rochdale. And as the tagline suggests, the UK's first employee and tenant owned social landlord. And I'll go into a little bit more about what that means uh, in a little while. I think our official tagline is the UK's first tenant and employee co-owned mutual housing society, which is a bit more of a mouthful. So I shortened it slightly to fit on the slide. So I've been working at uh, Rochdale Borough Wide Housing for just over a year now. So I'm quite new to the borough. Uh, not worked here previously, being a Manchester resident. Uh, and I'm delighted to see my colleague Feeder is also in the training because when we come to the Q&A session at the end, there may be some things which I can't answer, but Feeder's been here, I think, since the beginning. So he uh, he's much better qualified to, to perhaps answer some of those questions. Incidentally, uh, I've worked in housing for about six or seven years. So not new to housing, just new to the area. Um, and what attracted me to, to this organization was the fact it was a cooperative organization and, and quite unique um, in terms of the housing sector for being so. So the three things I'm going to talk about, um, first of all, a, a brief history of RBH and um, of uh, social housing in general, really. I'm not gonna dwell too long on that. It's quite a dry topic or I'm quite interested in it, but I don't expect everyone else to be. So then the latest in housing policy, which is uh, taking a bit of a turn at the moment for the better, in my opinion, and we'll look at the reasons why. And then finally, how we're gonna react as an organization and specifically my area of the organization, the community investment, how we're going to react to uh, what we perceive the challenges to be um, in a post-COVID-19 world and a post-COVID-19 Rochdale and, and how we're going to meet the challenges that our tenants may be facing over the next 12 and 18 months. So what makes RBH different? Well, in order to, to tell you a little bit about that, um, we're going to start with a very brief history, as I say, of, of social housing. and. Um, so council housing, as some people still refer to it, um, started to become problematic in the, the 80s and 90s. So uh, Thatcher's uh, Conservative government at the time were looking at rolling back the state or this demunicipalisation, as it was called at the time. Um, and part of that was housing. So she was challenging uh, the housing sector and, and council housing at the time to find alternatives to council-owned, council-managed housing. And so... When we talk about housing associations, that's just one example of, of the type of organisation that could manage or own or develop houses and social houses in, in place of councils. Um, and even within housing associations, there's a number of legal structures uh, which you can adopt. So at the time, they were quite controversial. Um, there was some private housing associations. They still exist to some extent. So, um, you know, they, they might offer... Uh, the profits to shareholders. Um, modern day housing associations are, are predominantly non-profit and, uh, and, and predominantly charitable, but at the time there was quite a lot of people from managing uh, council houses or ex-council houses. Um, other types of, of uh, landlords organisations you might see, some acronyms for you, don't worry there's not going to be a test at the end, but ALMOs, you may have heard of arm's length management organisations, TMOs or tenant managed organisations, uh, they all fall into uh, what we used to call RSLs, registered social landlords, or uh, a modern day kind of interpretation of that. People often talk about RPs, 
which is registered providers and, and registered with the regulator of social housing uh, in order to be able to deliver social housing. And, and if you are registered with a regulator of social housing, uh, it means that you have to conform to um, uh, different types of scrutiny, different types of performance, um, and you are rated based on, on that performance. And uh, that gives you access to, to funding and uh, that's how you can build new homes. That's in a, in a nutshell how social housing works. So in the late uh, 90s and early noughties, it was a really fashionable time for these arms length management organisations. So there was some funding available from central government in order to set them up. And the way that they differ from housing associations is that uh, the council retain their assets. So they don't sell off their properties, but rather they generate a new organisation, a non-profit organisation uh, that works very closely, is intrinsically linked with their local authority. Uh, the council uh, still own the properties uh, and they still take the rental income from those properties and the arm's length management organisation just manages them almost like a, a big letting agent if you like on behalf of the council. They collect the rent, they do the repairs um, but ultimately the, the council retain the stock and uh, that was a, a kind of an attractive option for councils that hadn't already sold off their council stock because they were able to maintain those assets. Um, so the, for, for local authorities and particularly elected members, and I'm sorry if we've got any local councillors on the call today, uh, but particularly for, for lo uh, locally elected members, if they were part of the housing portfolio at the local authority, they would want to retain some control over the housing being such a, a, an important part of the borough uh, and such a, a crucial lifeline for, for so many people living locally. So. Well, keeping the houses seemed like a, a, a good option, even if a, a separate organisation was set up to manage them. But it did still cause some conflict with local authorities, and I think even famously uh, RBH, which formed into an ALMO and so took a sidestep, if you like, away from Rochdale Council 2002, I think. FIDA might be able to confirm. Um, I think famously fell out with, with the council at some point. Uh, uh, it was kind of all over the, the, the newspapers and the headlines at the time, uh, certainly the, the housing related publications. And, and that's because it was a very new way for councils to work and those that were involved with the housing portfolio. Um, they were essentially relinquishing that control for uh, the ALMO, and in this case RBH, to manage those properties in a way which they sought fit, in a way which they felt was best for the, the tenants living in the properties. And as an independent organisation, organization their ideas may have conflicted with how council stock was managed previously uh, in if we fast forward to 2010 um, housing policy became increasingly challenging so under David Cameron's government uh, there was a number of things brought in which made it very difficult to to operate in the same way that social landlords were previously so for example most if not all funding was cut from landlords from being able to develop new homes for social rents so uh, things like shared ownership things like affordable rents outright sale they were all um, promoted in favor of social housing uh, there was also a couple of policies things like the uh, the one percent uh, rent cut as uh, for so for those of you that don't know um, landlords used to be able to charge uh, last year's rent plus 1% at the start of each year to accommodate for increased costs and inflation and all the rest of it. Uh, what David Cameron's government said was you had to reduce the, the rents by 1% each year uh, for the next five years. Uh, and whilst that might not sound like a lot, uh, for the organisation, the landlord I was, I was working for at the time, it was a, a regional landlord uh, at the time, probably about three times the size of RBH. It was equivalent to about six, 60, 65 million pounds worth in savings that were were needed to be found um, and for me that meant redundancy that meant the, the nice community investment stuff the investing back in communities the work and skills stuff the health and well-being that was all cut and, and that was quite common at the time uh, from a number of the larger landlords um, and for reasons we'll, we'll come on to later for what we call place-based landlords so Rochdale borough-wide housing you know clues in the name but Rochdale at the start um, they never lost that connection with communities and they never lost those outreach services and, and they're in a much better place now for modern housing policy to be able to meet the demands of, of what the sector is asking of us. Um, so at the time 
as I say, around about 2010 to 2011, uh, the, the, the financial model of uh, the council and the arm's length management organisation what wasn't going to stack up. The numbers just didn't work from what helped central government was giving local government in terms of social housing. So there needed to be an alternative. So RBH said, well, what's right for, uh, what's right for our tenants? Um, I think uh, it's, it's probably commonly accepted that um, if we were going to set up a housing association, uh, that when we balloted our tenants and that was brought in uh, to ring fence these private housing associations being able to come in and buy a load of council stock and profit out of it. So this thing, a, a voluntary transfer or LSVT, large scale voluntary transfer was brought in to the sector. And so we would have had to ballot our tenants um, to say, shall we set up as a housing association? And I think the general feeling at the time was that perhaps our tenants would have said, no, you know, we, we like being uh, linked with the council and, and we like where we are uh, currently with the arm length man arms length management organisation. So um, there was a lot of work at the time and it was before my time, which was done on what an alternative might be. Uh, and so it was all about ownership and being the birthplace of cooperation. Our CEO at the time and uh, a number of the senior management looked at how that would translate into a landlord, into a large landlord. And so they came up with an idea that had never been done before, which was a cooperative housing association. So they, um, or housing provider. So previously there had been um, cooperative housing providers in terms of tenant owned housing and, and tenant managed organizations is one example of that. Uh, but there'd never been one with employees and tenants. So they set about the task of, of um, looking at the detail about what that might look like. And it was truly pioneering, it, you know, as it had never been done before, we couldn't just go and ask people that had done it previously what the right answer to the questions were. And it took quite a lot of specialist uh, legal help. Uh, we had to trailblaze, we had to create our own uh, set of rules that, that met the requirements of the, the social housing regulator, but also worked for the organisation in a practical sense. And what came out of that piece of work was this unique governance structure that, that we have. And at the time, it was the only landlord, certainly in England and possibly in the UK, to have this particular governance structure. Uh, and the difference uh, on paper, certainly between us and other non-cooperative housing providers, is our representative body. So our rep body, of which I'm a member, and of which, uh, and, and why I'm particularly keen on this topic, and why I'm delivering this in the training today, um, the representative body is made up of predominantly tenants. I think 15 tenant members, uh, six um, employee members, reflecting the uh, actual ratio between employees and tenants, and then um, local councillors, and then we have a representative from our estate manager management board um, which is a, a similar model to a, a tenant managed organization and our TMO which is Turf Hill uh, and as a, a as an organ as a, as a body that sits within the the governance structure of RBH it actually uh, culturally is the highest authority within RBH now my colleagues in the legal department and the regulator for social housing wouldn't agree with me but actually the representative body is uh, in charge of the future direction of RBH. So the representative body comes up with our corporate strategy, which is our vision and our direction for the next three years. Um, they also hire and fire, if you like, our non-executive directors. I don't think there's been, been any firing to date, but we certainly appoint non-executive directors. And so they look after that really high level stuff. So the board, which is the traditional highest authority in a housing provider, still exists and still has a very similar role to all other boards. But because the representative body is in charge of appointing people to that board, I would argue that culturally our rep body is the highest authority in RBH. And that's what makes us different. I would say on a profound level, it means that um, the, the board that sits atop of the organisation and, and in some uh, landlords is not a very visible board i you know it's all happens behind closed doors and uh, you're not sure uh, what's going on and what the future direction of the organization is um at rbh you know that board can't take decisions that don't take into account the best interests of tenants and of employees because 
as tenants and employees are there to hold them to account uh, in that very structured, that very formal governance. Um, so profoundly, it's, it's a way of preventing an organization from running off in a direction which doesn't truly serve the people that it's there to serve. And uh, there are other examples of even charities where, where that's not the case. So that's what makes us profoundly different as a landlord and why uh, there's so much pride, I think, to, to work for RBH. Um, and in many circles, not all circles, not all of our tenants are, are our fans, but in many circles, I think tenants as well, and particularly our tenant members, uh, members of the organisation, I, I guess I should point out that uh, it's not a, uh, uh, an automatic membership. You have to opt in to be to becoming a member uh, but our members that really understand that vision and understand what makes us different and buy into that uh, and are, are represented at the highest levels of the organization are all very proud of our structure as well but we are still on the journey you know we're not perfect um, we're still learning people come to us all the time and ask us uh, how do you do it how does it work and we don't have all the answers um, there is a, a national network of uh, EOAs, which stands for Employee Owned Organisations. And uh, some of those organisations are profitable and they offer a, a surplus to their uh, members. So all their employees, for example, are members. Um, and so that's a, a real uh, advantage. That's a tangible kind of selling point point to coming to work for a cooperative that has a dividend for its members uh, because not only do you get your basic salary but based on how well you work as a team as an organization you get a share of the profits as well now obviously in RBH that's not the case uh, there's no financial dividend or financial incentive at all for becoming a member what we're asking you to do is to buy into our values and to buy into our belief system and to buy into our vision which is uh, creating a better landlord by working together, working cooperatively, uh, in order to um, provide the best services that we can. So, I want to come on now to kind of more recent policy and a, a, a project which we've delivered recently called Together with Tenants and Members. Um, and this came out of, you'll remember that I spoke about um, a kind of a tough time for landlords uh, in the early teenies, we call them teenies, 2010, 2011. And um, it was tough for a number of reasons. We had all of those policies which were quite tough for uh, landlords to be able to factor into their financial model. Um, but we also had a new uh, organisation that sat within central government, the Homes and Communities Agency, which relaxed a lot of the... Uh, things which are put in place to ensure that landlords had a really good relationship with their tenants. So they relaxed a lot of the mandatory um, policy around having conversations with tenants, about tenants being represented up and down the organisation. Uh, and a, a kind of a, 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 and that was actually allowed for teams such as myself and, uh, and other landlords to, to be made redundant because they felt that they didn't need that tenant voice and they didn't need that community outreach service within their structure because it wasn't regulated against it was no longer regulated against they weren't going to get a slap on the wrist from the regulator they could get rid of that stuff uh, because it didn't seem very crucial so the controversy surrounding this and the decreasing uh, relationship between landlords and their tenants and as i say place-based landlords to some degree are exempt from that so rbh maintains a, a really good relationship with his tenants, as did, as did other uh, landlords, Bolton at Home, Stockport Homes, One Manchester. Anything with the, the name of the place in the title gives you an indication that they're really connected to place. Uh, and that means that they make different decisions about their priorities and about how they spend their money. But the, the culmination of that uh, controversy was um, the fallout from Grenfell. And it was found that obviously, you know, uh, uh, tents have been raising concerns for a number of months if not years about safety in that block but elsewhere in, in that landlord's stock as well and uh, the, the unthinkable happened and so off the back of that um, there was an awful lot of lobbying people were already making noises but that was a, a real uh, motivator for uh, politicians to do something about it and so we had this green paper uh, which is a precursor to a white paper, which is precursor to new regulation or new laws for people that 
are unfamiliar with the, the way that uh, that works. And the Green Paper um, went out to all landlords and tenants and asked lots of uh, things about their experiences and their aspirations and um, it came back with a, a new deal for social housing and I would um, very much recommend people have a read of that if they're at all interested in housing because um, it had some really good recommendations in there. Essentially it was about um, having a better relationship with tenants, making sure their voices were heard up and down the organisation, promoting uh, more community owned assets, uh, and managing organizations in in a way which was for the benefit of the people that they were serving so as i've already said place-based landlords were a bit ahead of the game on this and when the uh, national housing federation decided to coordinate a sector-wide response to the housing green paper uh, they came up with this project called together with tenants and what they wanted to see um, was essentially a set of commitments from landlords to their tenants about the ways which they were going to improve uh, those connections and those relationships in the future. Uh, if, like RBH and those other landlords I mentioned in, in the region, you had a continuing or continued relationship through the lack of regulation and the lack of the requirement to continue that relationship with your tenants, uh, you're, in a, you're in a much better place to start these conversations for uh, more, um, for larger and regional based housing associations that took the decision to chase the money effectively, to, to go down the development route, to uh, work more as a private sector organization by um, uh, building homes for outright sale and building homes at uh, full market rate rents. Um, they lost somewhat their relationship with their tenants. They, they didn't prioritize that work. Um, and so I think, and this is a personal viewpoint, I can't say that I'm speaking on behalf of RBH, but I think they probably really struggled with this piece of work. So we, um, these were the six themes incidentally around the Together With Tenants project. So they wanted to see this list of commitments or a charter, um, which involved looking specifically at the relationship between tenants and their landlords. Uh, about how uh, landlords communicate with tenants and vice versa, about uh, tenants' voice and influence in the organisation, about how tenants were able to hold their landlord to account, uh, about the quality of services which landlords delivered as assessed by their tenants, and also uh, a section on when things go wrong. So when people have complaints, how transparent is is that what's the process for ensuring those complaints are dealt with uh, what to what extent are tenants involved with that complaints process oh lost my cursor so um, we were quite ambitious in our approach we signed up to be an early adopter first and foremost we thought well you know as the UK's first cooperative housing provider we really should be uh, paving the way in terms of our uh, approach to working with tenants and because of that uh, we actually had a tenant who was employed to lead on the project. So Andrew Johnson uh, was project managing the uh, the whole Together With Tenants project with support from uh, a couple of other people in RBH, but uh, ultimately he was driving it forward. We also had a tenant steering group for charter development. So whilst we had our in-house uh, project management um, uh, systems and processes in place and uh, a program board uh, with representatives from across the organization to look at how we can best implement this project. We also had a tenant steering group and they were able to work alongside the RBH uh, project board uh, and together in this kind of, uh, it says an exciting new approach to consultation and co-design, but it is, uh, it is approaches that we've used in the past. So um, by co-design, we mean not a consultation, I, we ask you a question, you give us an answer and we develop services off the back of what we interpret your answer to mean. Um, Co-design is very much come on the journey with us, be at every stage of the development of, of that journey. The final sign off and actually into monitoring performance against uh, those new things that we've implemented. So um, whilst there was some crossover, we did have these two groups op operate simultaneously. So we had the in-house program board and we had the tenant led uh, steering group and they would look at the same issues, they would come up with their own ideas, and then we would be we were able to merge the ideas across the two and come up with the, the final solution. Um, the representative body had 
ultimate say over the final draft of that charter. So again, the representative body is working at the very heart of the organization to ensure uh, the culture which it expects to see from the organization around their relationship with tenants uh, is delivered in a way which they deem to be uh, sufficient. And, and that's what the charter was saying. So I won't dwell too long on this, but this is a, a bit of a timeline of uh, events and activities uh, in order to come up with the, the eventual charter. So it's quite a long pro project, as you can see. Started off with um, colleagues being challenged to speak with five people each for five minutes and come up with some initial ideas for uh, what should go into that charter, what people's issues were, what people's experiences were. Um, we had a session with some uh, already involved tenants, then the board and the rep body got involved. We did some analysis, we did some big events. Uh, and then eventually uh, we were due to launch once the charter had all been finalized in April. And then obviously the lockdown changed our priorities. So not only could we not have the launch event, but we did think that um, due to the, the significant challenges people were facing, it was probably the wrong time to say, look at this fantastic piece of work we've done and aren't we great, et cetera, et cetera. So actually we'll, we'll probably launch it when we've got something to talk about. So the intention now is that uh, we're already implementing the, the commitments made in that charter. Um, so by the time we come to, to have a nice launch event and we're able to, uh, to share some information about that, those commitments, we'll actually have some performance recorded against them. Oh, I've gone back one too many. So again, not going to dwell on it too long because it's all available on our website. But um, these were the uh, summaries of things that came out of Together With Tenants. So uh, in those subsections that uh, the National Housing Federation wanted us to look at specifically, uh, we were able to make some, this is kind of, as I say, a, a general summary. And then there's more specific things in the full charter on the website. Should you want to have a look, uh, just uh, go onto our website and search for Together With Tenants. So our community investment priorities post COVID-19. So this is ultimately what the three um, areas that uh, us as a team will be working in. So uh, it's not as an organization what we're prioritizing, but rather just the community investment side of our resources. So the community partnership team is made up of um, some community partnership coordinators, some community partnership workers, some community partnership assistants, um, some facilities resource, and uh, recently the uh, reuse services, so our paint shop and our pass it on scheme, so that's our furniture reuse and upcycling scheme. So that's uh, really what we're talking about in terms of that resource uh, and the priorities relating to that community investment. Um, so we're saying that, you know, in the next 12 or 18 months, we think the most important for those people within that team to be doing, uh, the most important things for them to be doing are around financial inclusion, which essentially means saving people money where we can, uh, working skills and health and well-being. So uh, we recognise that um, people's incomes may be impacted now. That may, might be directly already. Um, we've seen a surge in universal credit claimants and our uh, money advice team and our income team are, are there to support our tenants that are struggling after moving on to benefits for the first time or after a period of time whilst working. We're also thinking long term, you know, um, we've got no idea the extent of the impact on the economy, uh, regionally, locally and also nationally. But we know that that's going to probably have an impact on our tenants. And it might be that people that were uh, had their own businesses that were self-employed can no longer trade and, and therefore uh, were unable to continue trading once things get back to normal. It might be that they need to uh, retrain, learn new skills, think slightly differently about a career path. It might be that um, people run zero hours contracts and in this period of time where there's been no work, they've, they've been unable to earn money in, so they're, they're at significant risk of financial hardship. So our financial inclusion and our work and skills um, priorities will, will almost work together. 
and uh, the health and well-being runs through everything because you know if, if you're not feeling up to it how are you ever going to uh, retrain or, or find work in a different sector um and so we need to concentrate on continuing to provide albeit in challenging circumstances health and well-being interventions where we can i'm running through everything more now than ever you know it's been a real revolution for for people having to become digitally included i appreciate that's kicking and screaming sometimes and, and people have really struggled and they're they've kind of been forced into it a little bit um but actually you know it, it has uh, had some positive outputs in terms of people's digital inclusion um, but I think it's really important to remember that uh, people aren't just going to suddenly become experts overnight and uh, people that are digitally skilled have often learnt those skills after, after a really long period of time or grew up around them and so we can't just expect people that are digitally excluded and not digitally skilled to instantly get involved with all our fantastic digital provision so there is uh, an acknowledgement that we're going to have to provide uh, services for people that aren't online too. So what does financial inclusion look like? Well our paint shop for those that don't know, um, it uses paint that would otherwise go to landfill. So paint that's been ordered and not used, paint that has dents in tins, things like that. Uh, at the moment we sell it at a flat rate to uh, the general public so anyone can go and use the paint shop. It's not currently open, it uh, should be by the end of the month. Uh, and also our, our new uh, tenants moving into their homes for the first time or their first tenancy, um, they get access to a bit of an allowance and they're able to, to go and get some paint from the paint shop. What we're saying is that there's probably more commercial um, opportunities there in terms of selling to the private sector, selling to private landlords, letting agents, having deals with private landlords, uh, where we can sell at a, a slightly higher rate, a more commercial rate, which will enable us to provide further savings for tenants. Um, so that is a project which we will be developing over the coming weeks and months. Obviously at the moment we're uh, offering a contactless service and a home delivery service only, but the paint shop will reopen after the necessary risk assessments have been completed. But what we're looking at is a fledgling social enterprise effectively. Your local pantry, a lot of you will be familiar with our pantries, so we um, support your local pantry is a, is, a, is a model, it's not a single entity. So we have uh, independent organisations managed by voluntary committees in uh, Kirkholt and there's a pantry that operates out of the Strand Hub and we have one in Smallbridge operating out of a, a unit on Stevenson Square. Uh, we're just about to open one in Freehold to serve the Freehold estate and we're also looking at sites elsewhere in the borough over the next 12 months because they work. They really work. They, they, uh, you know, they have instant cash savings for people. So if you look at our pantry literature and the model itself, uh, we reckon that uh, uh, an average weekly shop is about 15 quid and members pay three quid in order to shop at the pantry each week. At the moment, because we've utilized some external funding to increase that offer, um, we're, we're looking at about 25 quid's worth of shopping for three quid each week. So it's been a real lifeline for a lot of people. And I estimate uh, a conservative figure for savings for pantry members over the next 12 months at those three plus pantries is at least 200 grand. Pass it on scheme, similar to the paint shop in that it uh, utilizes um, furniture which would otherwise go to landfill. So we're saving on tipping costs. Uh, but we're going to utilize we're going to use it as a bit of a uh, another fledgling social enterprise uh upcycling furniture selling it at a higher price point in order, order to be able to offer further savings to tenants to those that are in real need of furniture i've just noticed the time so i'm going to speed up a little bit to give people a chance for questions at the end um so what we're saying is that there's an awful lot of solid furniture good quality furniture um uh, which is going to the tip because it's not desirable, because it needs a little bit of work to it. But we can set up a bit of a skill shop where we've got volunteers learning those skills, whether it be reupholstery or joinery or French polish even, uh, to be able to upcycle those bits of furniture, sell them on and generate uh, an income to be uh, put back into the scheme to develop it further. Other projects, things like supporting the local credit union, making sure that we're offering low cost borrowing um, rather than 
Uh, you'll see a big surge in organised crime groups uh, and illegal money lending uh, coming in and, and filling the void where people uh, are at the most vulnerable. So it's uh, tackling that from both sides, really. We also have a, a work by workshop where people can access clothes for work. Um, if they have an interview, they can access free clothes for work. So we're, we're hoping to expand that in line with our work and skills priorities. So we have a customer training uh, programme normally. Uh, obviously, all that's on hold at the moment. We're, we're going to explore how we can do that either whilst maintaining social distancing or online. Employment pathways. So uh, we're going to work with a whole host of partners to make sure that we've got employment pathways set up for uh, roles in specific careers or in specific industries. So people might go on a suite of five or six training courses and be guaranteed an interview with uh, an organization already trading in Rochdale or a new restaurant that's coming into the borough, we can make sure that we've got some ring-fenced uh, local employment opportunities in the lease that they organize with the council. Sector Connector, so this might be of uh, interest to many of you in the room. So um, I believe that uh, it's not necessarily uh, money which prevents people from developing their, their product or their service or the voluntary organization but actually it's it's not knowing who to go to to find out the answers it's not knowing what the next steps are and so uh, by utilizing corporate social responsibility and utilizing the social value act we can uh, coordinate the offer from private sector organizations and from larger larger organizations and link them up with grassroots and emerging organizations in the vcse sector to be able to uh, to, to sponsor them, to mentor them uh, through their uh, social value policies. Other projects might look like uh, setting up job clubs. Um, we have strong links with Hotwood Hall College and there's uh, a lot of devolved education cash through the adult education budget that we can make use of. And finally, health and wellbeing. Um, so we've had some fantastic examples of things that have been going on throughout lockdown. Uh, so. Um, I don't think Eric is in the room, but Creative Health, I don't think she'll mind me saying, did some fantastic uh, art packs for our independent living scheme tenants. We also had Cartwheel Arts, many of you will know, uh, had some art packs aimed at children, um, sort of looked after children and, and families that would otherwise be struggling. Um, and we managed to uh, distribute some of those through our pantries. Circle's been doing lots of online stuff. Um, we have uh, seen exercise tutorials from some of our funded gyms. Uh, and we've also trialing a Meals on Wheels service. But really what we're saying is that, and this is a plug here, our community funding is where we're going to be seeing the majority of our health and wellbeing interventions. So we're really um, pushing for people to think creatively along the lines of the example projects I've just said around um, how they can uh, deliver things slightly differently uh, and we can obviously finance that and we can help uh, grassroots organisations with some training, with uh, their infrastructure, with their governance to some extent, um, not in the same capacity as Action Together. And we'd always refer on to Action Together if it extends beyond our expertise. Um, but what we're saying is that we have this pot of money, which is up to £5,000, which is ring fenced for local grassroots organisations in Rochdale. And to my knowledge, it's the only pot of that size, which is ring fenced specifically for those organizations so we're talking about 150,000 pounds worth of turn turnover or lower um, so we can support them to to have a little think about doing their services differently action together and pull together the fact that fantastic ebook uh, that gives some examples including the ones i've mentioned about how to do things slightly differently uh, but we also have our community partnership workers which can work closely with those organizations uh, on their ideas and help them to, to formulate their bids into the community funding as well, which is now live, I might add. Uh, you can email me for more information if you so wish. Age friendly neighbourhoods. So we have a big commitment to create age friendly neighbourhoods and we're still looking at that. However, uh, there's things around the borough which are kind of on hold a little bit because we can't obviously deliver lots of the social engagements stuff that we were previously but it's also about investing wisely so investing in physical spaces and new builds widely to make sure they're age friendly and we can continue that work but we'll most likely pick up all our age friendly work again um, next year okay so we've got 15 minutes until uh we're due to finish so i'm going to stop sharing at this point
say thank you for listening uh, and see if we have any questions.